What's going on, guys? It is Tech Tuesday, uh, and we're going to be talking about some of the stuff that we have for Turbo S's. But we also have two very special guests. One is very small, and it may be named Chili Dog, and the other one, well, he's big and buff and just cute. <laughs> so uh, anyways, guys, in order to talk about what we're doing today, we've got to go over to Justin Smith, but we have Aaron Kaufman and Chili Dog. When you said we had very special people, I actually thought for a second you were talking about me until you said, you know, very small and <laughs> very cool. And I'm like, I'm neither one of those. Uh, you know what? Chili Dog is definitely the star of this show, no matter what, all the way around. But we do have an awesome guest, Aaron Kaufman from Fast and Loud fame in the house right now. Aaron, yeah. how's it going, man? It's going well. I am so happy to be here. And it's like, I'm always happy to talk race cars, race car parts, big, small, any of that stuff. And so, and kind of talk about my UTV experience and how I ended up here today. But it's like, I spent yesterday, we got to take the cars out, got some work done on it. And so it's already off to a great start. You know what? I think one thing that everybody around here learned very fast about you is that number one, you're cool as hell. Number two, <laughs> what everybody sees on camera is exactly who you are. The, I'll tell you what's interesting <laughs> about that, right? Is like when we first started, you know, and the TV show started taking off, it's like one of the things people would come up and they'd act like they knew me. I was like, these people don't know me, right? right? And it was like a little weird at first, but then I realized it was me that didn't know them. Like they were, cause I was on their bedrooms and their living room two or three times a day. Yeah. Oh, they had a pretty good feeling for who I was, <laughs> yeah. you know? So it took me a while to realize that, but you know, I, you know, I enjoy that, is that, that instantly, so when I go meet new people or I come to a place like this, like pretty quickly everyone gets comfortable because it's like if they've seen me on TV, I don't think it's a, a, that I'm very different from that. And so we had a lot of fun. The one thing is I feel like maybe I'm a little louder than people expect sometimes. But louder? Hey, oh, How is yeah. that even possible? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that and, you know, everybody around here is all car guys. We're sure. horsepower guys. We're we're car guys, we're, yep. we're everything that we all have exactly in common, no matter but, what it is. So but, it's easy to have a conversation when we like everything about the same stuff. 100 percent it's like and this is you know a church devoted to the religion of speed right mm. and it's like and no and no matter yeah i mean tell me it's not no no it's i'm just i'm, I'm laughing because that's like one of 101 liners you've had in the last 24 <laughs> hours you're full of them it's awesome yeah well i had a drive you know a 12-hour ride from colorado i said work them out but uh I mean, it's just like every, the reason for any of us being here, the reason is to make the machines that we bought or built, make them faster, work better, to perform the way that we wanted them to perform. Because it's like ultimately that's our entertainment. We take, you know, hours out of our life and like we make, we go to a job, we spend those hours away from home, other enrichment, and then we get paper for it, we trade the paper for these things. So it better be worth it, right? And we want more from it. We want to make those hours of our life, those dollars worth more. And so it's make more fun, have more memories, you know, especially with the people that you enjoy being around, whether that's in the shop or it's out in the desert or on the side of the mountain. And so it's like, when I say, you know, this is the church devoted to speed, I mean, and it's not uncommon, there are other ones, but y'all have your own brand of speed. And you know, when it comes to going fast, it's not just a horsepower game. If the car doesn't work well, if it doesn't connect, it doesn't matter how much you make. So, you know, you nailed it on that one. We can talk a little bit more about that too. So maybe we should just go out in front of your car. Absolutely. We can kind of walk around that thing and we can talk a little bit about what you jumped into by oh, getting it. Oh, yeah. And how you even jumped into the UTV it's, thing to begin I'll with. I'll tell you, it's, it's big a, cars to little cars. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting <laughs> switch. I'm still emotionally processing it. But, you know, but, <laughs> but here you we are. You admitting that you like UTVs. Oh, I, I, it is. It's difficult for me still. <laughs> I am there, but it's, it's difficult. So I guess the best place to talk about it is with the shock therapist. Let's go this way and we'll make it out, out to your car right this second. So you guys have watched this feed before, but if uh, you're jumping in because you're watching Aaron, then uh, this is kind of one of our main shops. We end up doing a lot of our UTV work out here. Um, shock work, spring work, most of the installation of everything is here. And uh, we'll go walk around Aaron's really quick. Woo. Now we've got some prototype stuff that we passed by and didn't show you guys because it's a little bit on the secret side. So don't look <laughs> over there. But uh, as we get around Aaron's car, which is a Turbo S Velocity. Yep. And um, I think that one thing that, these are super popular, right? Everybody um, loves a Turbo S, even though we've got Pro XPs and we've got new Turbo Rs and a whole bunch of other choices that are newer. Like these work really well. Everybody loved them when they came out. They still love them now. But my question to you that I think a lot of people sure. are gonna wanna know is, how do you go from race car, um, I mean, big horsepower stuff, yep. everybody's seen the stuff you guys built on the show. Yeah. A lot of people don't know all the stuff that you actually race and have fun with personally Out, outside now. Outside of it, yeah. Right? Um, but I mean, you're, 
extremely well rounded in the fact that what I've picked up sure. on in a short amount of time is it doesn't really matter to you whether it's aircraft or, no. or hot rods or um, remote control stuff or you know little itty bitty stuff to big giant yep. stuff. I'm sure battleships oh, are intriguing to you too. Well, and, and equipment, and I've <clears throat> I've had the pleasure of of like going and seeing. So I did another little program was called Aaron Needs a Job, and um, was <laughs> it was true. And it's like, and I'll tell you, uh, and this may upset people, but it's like out of doing all the car show stuff, the Aaron Needs a Job thing. I'll get right to the point. Was it's the most fun I've ever had making television because I got to go meet these people that had that had mechanical jobs. They were all machines, so it was like dirty jobs, but, but mm -hmm. it was all machines. And these people that they were second or third generation, and they were like, you know, what else would you be doing? They're like, no, 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 this is what I do. This is who I am. And I feel similarly, right? And it's like you don't know that necessarily early on. My dad's super mechanical, and I, I just got the gene, right? And then the, and then the curiosity soon, you know, came after. And I realize some people when they hear big nasty horsepower and they see trick suspension like they don't get off on it i'm one of the people that do and so i've been chasing that all, all you know all this time is like just more machines and it's like what i might like it uh you know lack in talent behind the wheel it's like i've made up for it in diversity and you know that my the, my position between being a machine operator that's the way i look at being a race car driver or anything else what the professionalism what, what level are you going to operate the machine at whether it's a feller buncher or it's a track hoe or a wheel loader right. or it's like whatever or a race car a little race car it's like how do you approach the job of operating a machine and so that's kind of a position I, I've always taken with it. And it's like, I can enjoy some smaller horsepower ones. And it's like, you can have a race with 15 horsepower cars as long as everyone has a 15 yeah. horsepower. Now it's yeah. competitive, right? Yeah. And so that's always a thing. <clears throat> and uh, my journey into becoming familiar and owning uh, you know, a UTV wasn't one I would have expected. And I had been very, very resistant, so much to the point that I like broke out when I heard people just talking about them. But <laughs> here we are, right? <laughs> yeah. Now you're part of the group that you're yeah. like, uh, not you guys, get yeah. out. You know, yeah. You're not if real you, cars. If you can't beat them, join them, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was your first experience that actually converted you? Well, I, I, I will tell you, so there was a process along the way. But like my first experience behind the car, and like we had pre-run in Mexico in them and done some things and I was already warming to the idea um, because this next this next generation are where this is and then now the new cars are bonkers mm -hmm. but like the this kind of era they really became they I felt like they were less toys and they were more serious and then I could see that in the speeds that we were running and what we were asking the car to do and so it's like I wanted to get in and financially it's like operating big race cars is really extreme when it comes to the finances and these things are despite their expense are more uh, friendly the first time I go, oh, I have to have one of these is, I believe it was last year at the Met 400. Um, I raced on a team with uh, with three of the guys in our car, and uh, I we came in a, I mean, in a top 10 car, even after a steering failure uh, on the car, but uh, with Adam Fritz, I put together a team, uh, Polaris car, and it was a narrow car, 1,000 NA, and I was, I mean, I drove the first lap on it. I was extremely pleased, and I thought the course was so hard, the fact that the car finished, when we crossed the line that night with our third driver, I thought, this is it. I mean, like, like they're obviously capable of doing the job. And so that was the moment I was like, all right, I'm going to buy one. But that being said, it's like, I didn't want to be responsible for building all the speed. And you know, it's like, ultimately you just end up with a case and a crank, right? And yeah, so it's like, yeah. after you've done pistons and rods and turbo, all this stuff, I was like, I'll just buy the one that already kind of goes fast. And then you get in it, first time you drive, you're like, oh, that's cool. And the second time you're like, oh, it's really slow. I need more speed. <laughs> <laughs> so what, um, when you first bought this Turbo S, you took it out for the first couple of times. I did. So that's the that's the trick. And a lot of people, a lot of viewers, they bought one, they took it out, and they started enjoying it. That was not the case. Based on the experience I've had with race cars, I knew that the consumer product was nowhere near the, the capability that I was after. Now I understand because you had actually rode in race cars, you had driven this stuff, yes. you went you went to the to the pace that you yep. wanted to run, and, the car and then you jump in this thing. You're like, I, I know what it can do. I did. So get this. I the first time I ever drove this was I use the term built a little lightly, and it's like I knew there were things that were, in my opinion, from a consumer standpoint, were like the product was very substandard, mm -hmm. right? It's like I knew that it's like we were going to hammers, uh, and I want, and so people would give me you know, trouble about buying a Polaris as opposed to a Can-Am. And it's like, I understand what they're saying, but I do have a different position. And the, the gentleman I was racing with runs Polaris. Mm -hmm. And so I bought the car that made the best sense as a pre runner And because I was real, I was focused on hammers where it's desert racing legitimately and rock rock racing legitimately. Mm -hmm. You need something that really does both well. The Can-Ams do, but our team was running a Polaris. 
And so, and so we got into it, and I knew that it wasn't capable. And so I wasn't even in the state of California. I had this thing bought in California, taken to my friend's house, and the cage was off of it, and it was stripped sitting there when I walked in the door. And this was five days before hammers. And so we threw a cage on it, built a winch mount. It's uh, We didn't do any suspension. Uh, I borrowed a set of PRP seats, put <coughs> harnesses in it, did lights, pumpers, GPS, comms, all this stuff. Because we were going to do race car things, we needed some race car part-time. Safety, at least. Uh, yep. Yeah. And then, but what was instantly obvious i mean the, the first time this thing had 2.7 miles on it when it pulled it out of the trailer on the lake bed and then instantly it was obvious that this car's speed limitation wasn't the horsepower that it makes ultimately the car just wasn't gathered up enough and especially when we got in the bumps on it and it rocks you can get away with anything right kind of mm. but like at speed this car was pretty hairy and 50 something miles an hour you were kind of hanging on and you felt like even though you might commit to go go a little faster you could swap out catch a bad buck I mean, it's like, it, it was, you could tell the car was kind of at its max. So you just felt that, that the limitation was definitely in the suspension. That was one of the things that you're like, I know exactly what I need to do. Exclusively. Mm -hmm. And it's like, because it, there, was, there was still more gas pedal left, mm -hmm. right? You could, the car would physically go faster. It's just, it might be on its roof. And so, and that, and that was the thing is like, I've always believed, whether we're talking about circuit racing, road racing, desert racing, it, like any variant of that, it's like ultimately, if the suspension doesn't work, then you can't apply the power to the ground. Okay. And so it's like the car has to be composed first because it's like, even if you make a thousand horse, if the car won't go around a corner, if it won't hook up, you, you could make a hundred, you can make 2000, it doesn't matter at that point. Yeah. And so we need the car to be composed to be able to do the work behind the wheel. So um, what do you think that, um that we're going to be able to do what in a perfect world if we do our job Not right think, no. then what do you, what do you know that this is going to do when you hop in it compared to before so you, so a couple <clears throat> things it's like i've known about some of the shortcomings in the velocity and, and i'll be honest it's like there was an amount of money I was willing to spend on the raw machine, but then the next part of that was, is that I knew that no matter what it was, no matter how good the manufacturer, whoever there told me it was, I knew it was less than half of what I wanted. And so if I had to upgrade big money, I didn't want to be deep in stuff that I wasn't going to want later. So right. we ended up with a velocity for a couple reasons, and I thought it might be okay. And it, and it clearly wasn't, and, I, and in the, specifically, the car was just heavy bottoming out, topping out. It, it wasn't the spring race were wrong. The car didn't have any dampening in it. And it's like, and so there, there was a speed and a safety concern there. And so we knew that we wanted to get into it. And ideally, it's like, if anyone is unfamiliar, it's like, go to YouTube, look up Class 1, Trophy Truck, Plaster City. It's like to see a vehicle with three foot of suspension travel where the body largely hovers and the suspension just works underneath it. As a driver, you get to decide where you want to put the car as opposed to anyone that has one of these bone stock. You just hang onto the wheel and, you know, it's like you or Jesus and then just hope for the best, <laughs> right? And it's yeah. like, as long as, long as four-wheel drives on and you're mm -hmm. matted, mm -hmm. you've got like, I don't know, 52% chance of coming out the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, so like what I'm after on it is like, I need spring rates that are appropriate for the equipment that's on the car, whether it's spares, whether it's, you know, uh, axles, tools, spare tires, a set, uh, you know, co-driver, navigator, these things like that, and then driving style. And, and so it's like, these are the things that we want. We want to ultimately have a plush ride and comfort too. If you're going to run a race that's six or seven hours, it's like getting your teeth knocked out, ultimate result in a bad finish, or you'll be locked up and in the hospital or on the couch for two weeks after the race, and that hurts the ability to get back to the next race. Exactly. So, no, so what I'm after is a, is a smooth car. It's short wheelbase and it's not very heavy. And so it's like there are some obvious limitations here. But at the same time though, it's like what we're after, or personally, is the car was all over the place. I'm just after a composed car so that when I decide to put the car there or there or how I want the car, it responds. So I'd like to be able to have a conversation instead of the car yelling at me. Yes, exactly. So. Now, are you going to turn around and, and actually race this all the time? Or are you just going to be playing with this thing? And I mean, so, like, your version so of playing, it. yes, so but which one's it going to get? His answer's all over the place. I oh, my you. God. <laughs> all so over the it's, place. Not, it's not either. It's linear, right? Yeah. So I bought the car to be a really nice pre-runner. Mm -hmm. And then, but like, I have this problem where it's like, Am I going to buy another one to race it? Oh, this car is kind of like, it's most ra uh, fucking love race it, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so like, so that's where we always end up like, I told myself I wasn't going to race this car, but I really doubt that that stays. You've there. seen you do this many times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I wouldn't be surprised if this one makes the conversion and loses most of the internal plastics and, mm -hmm. you know, it's like loses the swing doors and all that kind of stuff. We'll see. I have told myself if I, like, whether it, because... I think while desert is ambitious for a lot of people, and quite frankly, my heart is in point-to-point -point races. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I was 
the, the allure of racing Baja. And then when I started going and working for other teams, uh, it's like, it's magic, right? I mean, it, it's like, I mean, I've got goosebumps thinking about it. And uh, whether you're here in the States or you're in Mexico or Johnson Valley, you just get on the other side of the mountains and you get out there and it's so beautiful. And it's just you and your <coughs> homie and just ripping. And if the car's working and, and you're just, you know, fixing mistakes before they happen yeah. and just you know, dialing it up 10, 15 miles an hour faster. It's like, I just don't know that there are a lot better days. You can have it on a motorcycle, you can have it in a big race car, but you can definitely have it in one of these. And it's like, the price point is, makes it possible. And, you know, Mitch, you got something really good? Yeah. Um, does Chili Dog navigate for you? <laughs> she's, she's awful at navigating because we always end up somewhere where there's snacks or beef jerky. So she's pretty fond of peanut butter crackers too. So sometimes we end up at the gas station. So. <laughs> That's like uh, Hubert with Sticky. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's a, a, a right-hand girl. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and also, and I'll tell you, it's like, oh, I have a two-seat car, and I've been meaning to build her a harness that would go in there, and, like, she would be really stable. So anytime she's in this car, and she goes with me everywhere, coast to coast, all the adventures, all the stuff, and uh, so we have a lot of fun. But this car, because of, like, you know, the the rate of speed and the direction change and stopping and moving the car around and weight transfer it's a bit much for until i work out some kind of crazy harness but i originally thought i was going to buy a four-seat car but like there's a cost aspect and then the other thing is i've driven a couple four-seat cars not a lot of time driven and they were lazy on the turn in and i mm. ultimately wanted something that was comparable to the car we were racing for a pre-run i know a lot of guys will pre-run these because you can put the ice chest carry more tools right. third seat or fourth seat and so, I, you know, it's kind of a six one and a half dozen the other. I decided to go with this one because once I start having fun, I don't know that I want her in the car as we start turning it up. And so, I always knew it could turn into a race car too. So. <laughs> well, it's always good. You know, there's there's kind of a discussions amongst the guy that pre guys that pre run in Mexico a lot on whether they should you know be pre running with in luxury or pre pre running in something that's similar to the car. Oh. I'm like all about similar to the race car I so do, that you could. I do too. I mean, even <clears> to the point that like I believe in racing at the time, say you're, if you're not going to Ironman the thing, right? It's like if you're taking over the car at three in the morning, you need to be pre-running from three in the morning till seven or three. Yeah, no minute. point in pre-running daylight if you're racing all that, at night. That's 100% yeah. right because it's, it's a different planet than mm -hmm. it was that, you know, at that different time. And so I do believe in that. It's like, if you're going to be, if you're going to be sweating pools, you know, or freezing or like you do water crossings and like, it would better be, to know before a hundred percent because you need your focus there. And it's like so much of uh, off-road racing. I feel is rate of attrition. I mean, it's like you can get, once you get like maybe a top five, top 10 guys, like these guys push in a completely different space, but ultimately it's, can the car stay together? Can the driver and navigator, can they have a game plan that will keep the car together and keep them on track? for a podium finish, a good finish, a points finish, that kind of thing. So it's a little, it's not just like short course where it's a sprint and it's just all out mayhem. It's like the chess game is real on point to point racing. Yes. And that's one thing that I really love about circuit and point to point stuff is that there is a chess game. How, how long are you gonna wait to reel someone in? Where are you gonna try and reel them in? And you know, it's like some of the, you know, you have to take that into qualifying, you take that into race day, but it's like, it doesn't have to be that serious with these cars. And that's the thing is like, all my crap turns into race cars and so i didn't have anything like just to take out and have fun with and so i thought we'd do that but we all know where it's going so <laughs> well um maybe we can take a look at a couple of things that we're shoving Absolutely. on this because you know they have individual things that they're going to do for you if you're looking to yep. turn in and have some sort of feeling to it um maybe we can look at that really quick so sit right next to you if you take a look at this up close we're going to obviously we've done coil spring kits on the yep. car we've done shock internals and from the simplest description of those, if you don't know what that stuff's gonna do for you, spring kits are gonna account for weight and accessories. They're gonna give you the, the rate change from a plush upper combined rate to a, a heavier lower and stop you from bottoming out. Shock internals are gonna control that whole process in speed of how it accepts things, the plushness factor, um, rate of extension, rebound, speeds. Those are, are basically gonna make it to where the tire's planted on the ground it does what you want it to do when you put it into a corner that's questionable yeah. and maybe overspeed yeah. it or, or overcook the corner that it's actually underneath you. We're doing sway bar links front and back yep. um, just to strengthen up some of the weak spots on a Turbo S. We're also doing limit strap kit, super important on this stuff. If you guys haven't seen any of our limit strap videos, very, very, very important well, to do. But I'll, I'll tell you the first thing, it's like whether or not you want to talk <clears> about like the the advantages, right? Mm -hmm. Let's just talk about like, I just bought this $30,000 car. Why does it sound like a bucket of bolts? Why does it make so much noise? Mm -hmm. I'll be honest, I chased whatever was loose and falling off this car. 
a couple weeks because you go driving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, I just bought it. And the thing's falling apart. And I haven't even done anything hard in it. <laughs> anyway, and it's like, and also I talk to some guys, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's totally, because like some shocks are, they're built with top out protection in them. Yep. These apparently are not, not for the factory. <laughs> and so it's like one of the things is like, also when you're hearing all this stuff, you're concerned that something is off. So your confidence when you start to lean on it starts to fade a little bit yep. because you're not sure if something is coming off and how you need to address that. So that you know, on the limit straps, not to mention the dur the durability of the equipment, right? It's like even though that we're and we get into bumps and we're starting to slow down the velocity of the wheel, tire, suspension, shock package as you know that weight droops out. The biggest thing is it's like when we get there, we also don't want to be snapping the shaft all the time and hitting all of our hardware on it. So ultimately, the vehicle will last longer if we're controlling that last you know fraction of an inch on it. And so like to me, I think strapping it was, I mean. I don't know how they didn't come from the factory this way, you know what I mean? Yep. I think it's super important. And you know, the other thing about my car that I noticed is like, the darn thing just sits at coal bind, and if y'all don't know what that is, it's like, it's like having metal sleeves over the shock, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the springs all the way compressed out, and it's, they use a methodology about picking springs on this car that I will never understand, and that's okay, I'm okay with it. But now my car effectively rides on two different springs. A portion of the travel is much more compliant and allows the car to float really nicely, and then after we hit something big with a lot of velocity, the heavier spring rate, once it hits the coilover, now becomes, so we end up with, with two different versions of uh, the suspension on the car. We end up with a plush compliant one and one that's much more battle Born, you, know. you know, in the future, I think I'm not going to describe anything that we do and make. I'm just going to let you talk about <laughs> yeah, all I, of it because that sucker right there kills it. <laughs> yeah, I think you might know way more about shocks than we do. <laughs> oh, that's not true. Uh, you're hired, by the way. <laughs> well, well, I'll be a bad therapist. The uh, so and, you know the other the other the, the other thing we talked about is like is because we play in the rocks and it's not it's it's a problem that exists in the desert and, the, and I don't know about the sand I don't have any experience in it but steering components take a massive amount of abuse whether it's in your two track and you're doing 80 miles an hour and you hit up you know uh, you know baby head or something the size of a basketball it's like all that energy is is directly into the tie rod and the factory tie rods on this are they're not a lot bigger than a passenger car. Exactly, thanks for teeing that up for me. That kind of throws us right into the next pieces that we've thrown on the front of this. So we've got a billet rack and pinion steering box in there that obviously you guys are aware of. We've got them all over the place. That is much stronger than the factory one. It'll stop you from having any wearing out, uh, premature wearing out of the rack. Um, loose feeling in the well, front, which completely makes it to where you can't enter a corner if the thing's wobbling around. No, no, around. but it's also precision, right? Yeah. And it's not that, like, I don't think the, the steering mechanism, the rack itself, is inherently bad on these things, mm -hmm. but it's like, once again, it's like once you're used to moving at a certain speed or asking a certain amount of things from the car, and you know, it's like, as a, you know, even if you're not racing it, right? Performance driving, it's like, particularly in racing, you're going to ask not just 100, but you may ask 102, 104%. And that, you know, that's the difference between standing on the blocks and watching someone spray champagne, right? And so it's like, you need to be prepared for those things. If you don't prepare to win, you'll never find the podium. And even if that's just, if winning is having the best weekend of your life out there, Sometimes dragging this thing back on ratchet straps and chains and log stuffed underneath it is not how you win the day, right? Yes. And, and so we wanted something that was a very precise feel, and I, you go into a corner, especially if you were smashing a berm really hard, and to believe that everything in the car was tight and was going to stay that way, and we can just keep the throttle down. Well, the, the billet rack definitely covers all of those issues. And, and where's also, the billet rack built at? Well, it happens to be built right here at Shock Therapy, <laughs> made in the USA, 100% of the parts, which we've had many discussions about. Yeah. And no matter what the components are, we always try to have that stuff made in house uh, with the exception of some of the things we have to sub out, for instance, like springs. Springs are made in the USA. Our sway bars are made in the USA. It's very important to us that we have all of those things sure. done here. Yep. And I know that's well, dear to your heart too. But, but it absolutely is, I was like, you, you'd be hard pressed to find someone that's more emotional about American manufacturing. You know, and I really, I, I'll be honest, I didn't know what to expect. I need, I knew that I needed help with the Walker Evan shocks. They were, I know that they had a lot of deficient areas. And so I was looking for someone. I talked to Rick over at UTV Source and I know they move a lot of shock therapy stuff. And so I knew he'd have a good answer. And he suggested I come down, talk with y'all about it. And then things kind of snowballed and like we're getting the full setup here the car set up on it and people that just kind of weaken more they don't realize how much cars how important it is to what they're feeling and the, the amount of fun that they're going to have and it's like y'all definitely have the experience here and that's been evident in a the speed we got the car together and then the lineup here in the shop too you know a lot of people um, always ask that of us like hey I don't, I don't know that I really need that I don't really run that hard and you know I'm not racing I know I, really I know why stuff. you don't run that hard it's because your car won't go that hard <laughs> and it's like and so I was talking yeah, so, <laughs> drop that mic yeah I was like whether you like it or not that's the case and it's like and one of the things we're 
talking about the quality of the cars and talking to Steven, he said he's not necessarily a guy that really likes to have it on the wood mm -hmm. and like maybe don't come home that night. I got it. But he was saying that like you can tell how much better the cars are getting and like when the when they go through a shock therapy rehab, right? Mm -hmm. Like once these sons become y'all's cars, how much faster you can go and comfortable. So he doesn't it's like so the, I thought it was an interesting take on it. Like I'm not driving any harder. The car works so much better. I can go 15, 20 miles an hour faster in the same comfort zone. And so I think that's what a lot of people don't realize is where they thought their max was and white knuckling it and locking out on the steering wheel that they can get comfortable and loosen the car and the car will go 15 miles an hour faster. So, you know, super good point. And a lot of people don't believe that until they actually get it done and they do it. Driving's and then, believing. And then it's obvious at yep. that point. But prior to that, there's so much advantage and there's so much that can actually be done. But there's so much these. static out there too. You know, it's like, we're not like, oh, I don't race. I understand that. But it's like, you've got a lot of money in, in a performance vehicle. There's a lot more performance left in it. I don't know how people don't want it. But ultimately it's comfort. It's enjoyment of the machine because like always wrestling with it and you know, and whatever your speed is, it's like you may be having some fun. They don't realize what's left. Like how late you can enter a corner, how hard you can break the car and like how hard you can mat it through the whoops mm -hmm. until you get a car they'll do it. You go, how would you ever go back after that? You couldn't. It would be impossible. We were talking about six speeds to ten speeds in autos the other day. There's no going back, you know, after you ha after you've had a you know one of those. Right. So well it's it's very true. And I think the best advertising that we have as a company are the customers that have already gotten sure. their stuff. Because like you said, they're not gonna go back. Yep. You know, from that point forward, the brand new vehicle that they've just bought, if they're getting a new one every yep. two years, uh, we got guys that don't even put two miles on them. They just know yeah. that there's more in it. That's a hundred percent. They drop it off before they even drive it. You know, we kind of prefer that they would drive it and then we do it and they can see the difference. But, but, but you know, I'll tell you one of the things about shock therapy here that I was surprised to find out. And I'll tell you the gentleman that I raced with, with Brian, he's also one of your customers. He puts cars together for, you know, for guys uh, as a side hustle. And what, and so we were talking about running another company springs, putting a spring kit on a car mm -hmm. and then it worked better, mm -hmm. but it wasn't amazing. They weren't very excited about it. So they got on your website, they filled everything out. And that was the thing is how much y'all take into account? What kind of cage? How big a tires? How big, how, you got a co-driver? How heavy are they? What how other equipment are in the cooler? A hundred percent, right? This is a very important. And so mm -hmm. it's like, he got a spring kit from y'all, put it on the car and the car was night and day better, right? Just from coming from an aftermarket spring kit to y'all spring set up on it because the other company just, it was a generic for the car, here you go. And they know that it's better, so most people will be happy. But y'all take the time to find out, to personalize it. How How is someone going to use it? What are your expectations to get out of it? And then of course, there's respringing it, there's respringing it and strapping it, respringing it, strapping it, revalving it, you know, and then moving into car setup. And it's like, what kind of experience do y'all want to have? And I think that's interesting that y'all offer all those different levels and you can come to Phoenix, you can mail this stuff in. It's like y'all offer a lot of different ways to get to the design result what was um what was the biggest maybe preconception that you had before coming here i guess what i maybe to try and narrow that down sure you know what did you think of what we do or, or us prior and then now having been here and taking a look at what we put into it and how we make things what was what was the biggest thing that was so maybe different the, or your thoughts the manufacturing uh was extremely surprising right like i didn't real i didn't i didn't realize y'all built all this stuff in house i didn't realize what y'all carry in house i didn't realize how many vehicles y'all do i didn't realize how fast the team moves and uh so every one of those things have been really really impressive but it's like i see you know it's like i see y'all on you know on the instagram and on the internet and stuff and ultimately what i what i end up uh, seeing is I feel like these are kind of generic packages they work better and kind of like some of the the other guys the other teams you know uh, but it's like coming here because I came from a suggestion from Rick he's like call these guys they understand this stuff really well he didn't go into a lot of detail that how well and how you approach it and then I, I got to find out about your history and it's like how you got into building the shocks and why you got into building the shocks and then like the evolution of it and like I think evolution is the only way to describe these things 10 years ago they didn't look like this they didn't move like this you know what I mean and it's yeah, like we back like 15 years away from a rhino. Oh you yeah, know, a hundred percent. Oh, at one point they were just awful uh, side by side, or uh, awful quads with a body on them, kinda, yeah. you know. <laughs> and so not very far from an Odyssey. And so uh, it's, I have been, I've been blown away with just like how sharp y'all are on this. You, you know what I mean? And it, cause it looks like y'all move through it just like water through rocks. Like, you know, it's just like y'all know what it is, right to it. And then the personalization for each one of these cars, no no two cars in here are getting the same setup on it. And it's not like y'all are taking two or three days to figure out like you have a program. And that's one of the things I was really impressed with is like once you go to filling it out and discussing what you use the car for, how sharply you pick out the, what it needs to be. And you know, at some point it becomes a little bit of a program, but like I really think the personalization, the manufacturing here, and then just 
it's the operation is far sharper. I thought it was much smaller. I didn't realize how big y'all were, and then y'all are really sharp at this. Thanks for saying all that. Um, the checks in the mail don't tell anybody on that, but. <laughs> <laughs> So I think um, we might have gone through as much as we've been doing on uh, his uh, car. Yeah. Plenty. I mean, everybody's kind of got a, a feel for some of the items that we're doing. Um, and, I, and I think everybody has a feel for how you got into this and yeah. what you want out of sure. it. Sure. Um, I wonder if anybody's got a whole bunch of questions about I'm sure there's a question about or two. you. Let's yeah. talk a little bit more about your history. Let's skip the, uh, the advertising. Yeah, sure. Right? And, and get into that. So one thing that struck me when we first met was... Um, how much knowledge you have on different areas that aren't just specific, you know, hot rod base. Yeah. It's not like you're an expert in Corvettes. You know, you're an expert in a whole lot of no, things. I'll, so I'll tell you the only thing I'm an expert in. Well, I'll or? tell you the only thing I'm an expert in is having a good time. That's my, that, that's, <laughs> you know, everything else I'm just working on. Um, you know, was that, was that like instilled so, by mom and dad or is that just so my, uh, so my pops, so my pops is like, I remember my dad bought a computer, brought it home, put it on the table, taught himself automation. And so my, my dad was into like plant automation. And that and then my dad was always a, a little bit of a hot rodder, built cars, motor swaps, you know. Uh, this would have been right to the point that I came onto the scene. And uh, and so my dad's super, super mechanical. And so, and I, yes, I got the gene from him. And one of the things that's been allowed me to do some of the things in the industry that I've done is like, is that, that gene, right? The mechanical gene It's like, I can see how things work to understand them. And then being self-taught on basically everything, it's like, I was happy to, to have the experience, the failure. And, and we were talking earlier, it's about, I really appreciate trial and error because if someone teaches you, uh, whether it's school, uh, educator or something like that, if someone teaches you that, if you don't have the motivation to, to learn it on your own, you will ultimately learn one way that it works. When, when you go through trial and error, and you gotta remember, all education is expensive. You can pay someone else, or you can just spend the money in the process, but once you learn through trial and error, ultimately, you know 100 ways it doesn't work, and you know two and a half ways that it does work. You can smell a mistake so much earlier, and you understand so much more about what you're doing when you know how it fails, why it fails, and where it fails. And this is everything from just doesn't work the way you wanted to absolutely comes apart. And so, uh, my dad, I got it from my pops, the mechanical aspect mm -hmm. of it, but it's an appetite. I've always been interested in it, and like briefly in life, I've taken breaks from doing stuff like this, and like there's, it's like the mob, there's no getting out. It's like when I'm not doing it, I mean. <laughs> Another one-liner right there. That's, I think, five, we're keeping track. You guys, uh, every time he throws a one-liner in there, you guys have to drink. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. And so the, the deal is, is like, it's like when you're not doing this, all you're thinking about is doing this, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so, and I found even as a business owner, it's like the bigger my business got, the further I got removed from doing this. And let me, I'll be honest, it's like, it's not that every job in the shop I still want to do, but it's like, I love doing this. And I like ultimately, this is the one thing about like our industry. And it's not just UTVs or race cars, but hot rods or building machines is that once you're done with all the work, the fruit of your labor is watching it do the thing, right? Whether it's behind the wheel or it's like if you're a tech or a builder watching the car lead the line or watch it do its thing out there. Not to mention, if you do a good job of building a proper piece of equipment, put the right driver in it, amazing things happen. And we've seen that since the inception of the car. And so that's one thing that makes this so much more fun than so many other industries is like once we're done working, we get to have a tremendous amount of fun. So I, I watched uh, Fast and Loud like most people did. And I, now knowing more about you, it, it feels to me like, you know, what you did on the show and working on those vehicles was yeah. like completely um, beneath what you were capable of doing. So I'll, you know? I'll, I'll, do, I'll, ch I'll check you on that. No, what, nothing no. against what you were doing no. at all. But it just seems like, um, you know, you could have completely designed the whole car as opposed to fixing one. Well, right? maybe, but we had these insane timelines. And, you know, it's like, oh man, I'll tell you something about that. So it's really one of the greatest experiences I've ever had. And there were a lot of negative experiences wrapped up inside of it. But ultimately, put it this way, in five years, uh, did 100 episodes, 81 ground up cars. Uh, all but about two or three I'm very proud of. And then for every one of those, we brought two cars back to life. And so, or more. And so- What do you mean by brought two cars back uh, to life? Like, you, like we'll find cars that like needs a fuel pump, carb air, valve set oh, on between it. Between the ones Rust. that builds on the show, yeah, yeah. you had a few more Yeah, in the yeah so yeah. we okay. always have A and B cars. And the yeah. A car is the one we just built from frame up or scratch yeah. and all these things. And so I got to have a lifetime of building cars experience in five years, building 81 cars, ground up. I had a good team and like well, periodically, and we, it's like, 
we had a tremendous amount of fun, but the neat thing was there were two things afforded to me that were not afforded to most people, is like, because we had this incredibly insane timeline, and like, you can do the math, in less than five years, 81 ground up cars, it's like we're building cars in two weeks or four weeks, and then I'd break someone off to handle bugs for about three or four days, or just finish up a car and move, and move it, move it, move it. So we always had to have a solution, and not next week, maybe not tomorrow, right. tonight, right. first thing in the morning when we walk in, we have to have solutions. The, the unique thing is there's a lot of money in TV, and it's not that we had an unlimited budget. That is clearly not the case because sometimes we'd have we'd have to play a little triage. The next project couldn't go quite as far if the last one cost too much or yep. we'd front load them or stuff like that. So I got to do things that, like, like quite frankly, it'd be hard for me to find a customer that wanted to let me do those things, and I couldn't afford to build those cars. So I got to, we had big budget, I had a good staff, we had a good location, and so I was able to kind of do things that I'd always wanted to do, and most of the time it paid dividends and it worked out, and I was really excited to be able to have that kind of uh, experience. And I think that, because I started off, I feel like as a really, you know, I felt like I got it, you know, maybe better than some people, but ultimately didn't have as much experience as some people, but we quickly oh, eclipsed that just because of how fast we had to run. It was a wild experience, and you know, and like, and I did, I traded a portion of my life to gain that experience because we didn't do anything but build cars for five years. I mean, it was, it, you know, when we first started the television show, yeah, we were working 100 and uh, 115, 120 hours a week. It's like we'd go home, we'd leave the shop, lock up and leave at three in the morning. We'd be back at, you know, eight, eight thirty in the morning. And this is seven days a week. And after six months, it was like, we can't do this anymore. We'll start backing it down, mm -hmm. hired a couple more guys and then go to the new shop and that kind of thing. So it, uh, I found, I was able to kind of come into my own, right? Like I, we had enough money, we had the money horsepower to get me where I wanted to go. As long as I had the vision on it and the team, uh, you know, my team played well and despite all the yelling and screaming, <laughs> Richard ultimately played well too. I mean, cause we had to get to the end. Right, so. well, there's always gotta be a story sure. in the middle of the whole thing to make it work. Sure. What do you think the main thing that had actually um, changed in your life because of the show? Yeah. If you could actually put you know, it down to one or two I, things. I, I have it. I'll tell what you. Is the, what's the biggest thing that changed oh, for you? The biggest thing is like the, what's, it, what's in my, uh, the Rolodex, in, which is some, uh, the contacts in my phone. <laughs> <laughs> you almost so, dated yourself pretty hard there. <laughs> yeah. And so the deal is, it's like, I've got to meet so many of my, and it's like, we can be, um, I would say heroes, but I, that, what I mean is people that I really look up to for their talent or their personality or the way they, they approach things in life or in the race car or in their own shops, even if it's a, a removed from racing. And so I've got to meet so many of these people that I think are legends, right? And then be able to talk with them and like, and just really kind of understand our trade, our craft, our industry a little better from different perspectives. And it's like kind of everyone runs into the same problems. They have the same problems in business, the same problems in marketing, the same problems in the shop, in the showroom, mm -hmm. all these kind of things. And so like the people that'll answer the phone when I call. That has been one of the biggest miracles. Only, the only thing that, you know, while we're here is the, what we, uh, what we leave with other people, right? Yeah. When we're gone, that's the, legacy. that's the, that's the only thing we leave behind, right? Is our imprint on the people around us, right? right. And so that's been the thing that's been the, the, ed the education experience I had has been phenomenal, but the people I've been able to meet, work with, hang with, and to go do this kind of stuff with has been phenomenal. That has hands down been the best part of it. That's really, really cool. I wouldn't have guessed it, but it, it makes a ton of sense and it affects a lot of people. Sure. Um, Steve, you got a question? This is a two-part question. Sure, sure. Um, what did you do before Fast and Loud and how did you meet Richard Rollins? So about both of them pretty straight. So so like how so meeting Richard. So I had this little tiny. I had like a thousand square foot shop with one man door, one roll up door, extremely hot in Texas. And so I was building bag kits and bagging cars and shaving tail lights and moving stuff and tubbing things. I mean like your standard like punk kid in a garage with a welder. Like that was what was going on. And uh, and then and so I this other this other shop uh, near me was selling all this stuff and I was going and buying bags from him and I was telling so I walked in, I said, I'll make you a good deal, right? You can hire me and I'll have a job and then you won't have any competition in town. <laughs> and it Keep worked. Going. And it worked. And so so I started working doing it, you know, getting paid for it. I, you know, what do you want to call it, professional or not? I was getting paid to do the work, customers bring their cars in. Mm -hmm. And so you learn a little more with every every experience, every vehicle. And that was really early on. And then so at this place, Richard shows up, he bought, uh, he had been, had a printing company and he was buying in the back, was buying and selling hot rods and stuff. And most of the ones he would buy really were cool to look at, but didn't work so well. Mm -hmm. They had one that was bagged and the bag job was foul. It was really, really bagged, the, the air suspension. And so he brought it, we fixed it, did some cool things and that's how I met him. 
So flash forward maybe about another year, he calls me and asks me if I would uh, do some work on another car they were going to do as a giveaway. It never ended up getting given away, but so I came and did it. Asked me if I'd come around the shop. There were only two other guys working there, and like I could see there was more potential and money and opportunity there. Mm -hmm. And so I closed my shop in the middle of the night, throw my crap in a trailer, and like and he didn't have much equipment, and I had equipment. Now my equipment was junky because it was all I could afford, but it was mm -hmm. more than he had at the time. So we went over there, I started building hot rods and Richard was into wild and crazy things and I was happy to throttle up and do it all, you know? And so we had wild stories that shouldn't be on TV and we had, we had some crazy times in this country and other countries and it was great. It was a wonderful experience. And then Richard, you know, he was always hip to being famous, to building a brand and doing these things. And like, I never believed that, I mean, I'll put it this way. If my, if my hot rod, I mean, hot rod, I didn't have hot rods, they're expensive. If my, if my Harley was running, if I had rent paid, if I had more than five hundred dollars in the bank, and I had beer for the weekend, everything in my life was wonderful. But Richard <laughs> had bigger ambitions, and so and so we we started going that path, and we chased it, and pretty and it's like we did some sizzle reels for stuff, and we had been shooting some shows, like I say shows for that are aired in other countries in the like the rallies, like uh, Gumball, Bull Run, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, and so I'm familiar about being around cameras and doing all this kind of stuff. So, but I just love laying on floor, making cool stuff and doing burnouts and just being, you know, a degenerate generally. And, uh, <laughs> and so, so we ended up, uh, so the TV show thing starts to take off and we shot the sizzle reel, which was really a travel show about going to different places and learning about the fuel culture in those places. And I was in love with the, uh, the possibilities. Anyway, so two years gone by, I'm working at four wheel parts, putting in gears, lift kits, you know, doing the thing, right? And Richard shows back up, I hadn't seen him in a while, shows back up and says, hey, they want to shoot a new sizzle reel. I was overdoing TV, I wasn't into it anymore. And he said, don't say no, just call me tomorrow. Well, the guys I worked with were super rad and, and I, it was my birthday month and so I could take an extra day off that month. So I asked one of the guys to switch a day with me. I called Richard and I said, hey, I can do I can do two days, not three days on the sizzle reel, and I knew it's production, right? So I knew that if I went and they were shooting, they were gonna buy my lunch. So over two, so over over two free sandwiches, I'm standing here today. Because it's like so I knew they'd buy my lunch. So we shot a sizzle reel. Two weeks later, they uh, we started shooting fast and loud because what the conversation was is we were kind of in the deck and like. I don't know if y'all know this, but at network television, right, the management gets changed over faster than I changed my underwear. Mm. So if someone else came into power, cleared house of everyone else's shows, wanted to bring their own up. We were in the queue. And so, hey, can y'all guys build cars? Yeah. And they were like, mm. can you build them in two weeks? And I was, Probably not, but yeah, sure. <laughs> and so, so we got into it and, you know, and then the rest kind of is history, right? Like I learned how to build them that fast. And then once we could build them in two weeks, I uh, added more stuff and then we pushed for going to four weeks on it and so it was it's always just been a progression to go more and more and more and I will tell you you didn't ask the question but where did I find the limit at you know we built cars like uh, you know the Ferrari which we subbed out a lot of the body work on it but it's like the GT was it's the most expensive car we built and it was uh, challenging on some parts but the white Pantera that we did which was the world's first swapped EcoBoost there were some other guys doing it we had the first one on the road the first one completed we had a lot of challenges the first Hellcat swap that was ever done we did it on TV mm -hmm. and so like that's kind of the level of like trying to push, push, push. But the Pantera, the list, we, the car's not the car that I had envisioned. There were a lot of things we had to cross off. And on the program, most of the time the way I start is like, this is my build. Hour one, I'm crossing things off. Day two, I'm Production crossing. Production crosses it off. A hundred, a hundred, well, yeah. they're, they're no longer possible. It's more yeah. car in the time frame. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know if you noticed, but none of my cars had radios in them because they don't make the car go faster, stop harder, or turn harder. And so, like, <laughs> it does not good TV either. Does it? Yeah, yeah that wasn't something I was interested in. I was into building cars, you know, it's like I've got a stereo at the house, you know. And so, <laughs> so anyway, that's it. It's been, and like, the biggest thing for me was it gave me access and opportunity to meet you know teams like this this other end of the uh, the other end of the industry because like we really didn't do a lot of race car stuff but that's where I was drawn to because when it comes to street cars there is such a wide range of works right yeah. you know what I mean it's it's all gray area but when it comes to race cars when it comes to winning it's like there is there is only the way that works and there it's like this is it and everything else is a failure to some degree right mm -hmm. and so i like that chasing that and it's like i'm not to, not to say that like we nail that perfection or get even close to it all the time but it's always the chase can we be faster can we do better what did we learn from this whether it's driver development and that's the other thing or, or the machine but for me it's like learning how to to you know we have all these skills in life right like learning to weld right there's all these these processes along the way I feel like driving is the same thing, is that like there are, everyone can go from A to, well I'll say everyone, a lot of people can go from A to B, right? But like how you get there does matter and, then, and it's quantifiable in a race car. Yeah, for sure. Everybody's going to see it on a stopwatch. True. But um, with, with the show um, going away, and, or, or I should say the next step for you sure. since the show, 
I mean, what is it that? So every, we did. What are you doing now, and what do you want people to realize? Oh, I'll give you. I'll give you the. Yeah. Oh, I'll give, I'll give you maybe the, the short tail, right? Mm -hmm. And so, there were some things that happened, and I, need, I needed to leave. And so I left mm -hmm. that show. But the, the TV and production wasn't quite done with me. Asked me what I wanted to do, and my interest, my my love affair was in the race cars, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I love building hot rods. I mean, deeply. But like, my fascination was in the race cars. And so we did a uh, did a show called Shifting Gears, and it was all race cars. But like, the attempt to build competitive cars in a hyper short time frame and then go and be competitive in the car was we were getting cars we were finishing in the pits and like in getting operational so i had zero track time on so from behind the wheel standpoint i was so far behind the ball it yeah. was difficult i was never going to be competitive in it mm -hmm. and that was really hard on me and then it's like i was really driving the guys really hard because like how i wanted a car it's like i couldn't bring like oh it works like i needed a race car to look like how i wanted my race cars and it was really challenging because i was asking more than was available in the time so it's stressful for the guys stressful for me and so i decided because I couldn't get where I wanted to go with it, I needed to step away from that. And I went into that Aaron Needs a Job show, and it's like I said before, hands down, my most fun making television because I met people. They were just like, I wouldn't do anything else. This is what my people do. That my dad did that. My grandfather put that in there. I've gone to plants where there are people that are three generations working under one roof, and so it's like that's the that's the thing I enjoyed the most. Not to mention. We go to these places and they let me run machinery that there is no reason they, let, they should have let me around. And some of this stuff is quite dangerous. And I've got to do things, I've done things so far in this life that I wouldn't have thought in 10 lifetimes I would have ever been able to do. And, I re and so much on that show, it was like meeting people that make your life and my life and these guys' life so the, as civilized as it, as comfortable as it is, and no one knows their name and no one knows what they do. And it's like how these products we use every day find their way into your house, you know, or the, how we turn the lights on your house when you turn on a faucet, how it gets there. So in all of that, I view through the lens of machines, right? Mm -hmm. It's like this is the innovation. And like we've led the world for so long in innovation. And so like I love that's who we are. I love that I got to experience it. What's the next chapter for you? And let's say what's so, five years. Where are you at? Oh, <laughs> I yeah, stumped uh, him. Uh, How? Uh, oh, now the question. <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess it's time to hit the couch now. <laughs> yeah, so. He's so, a uh, brand ambassador. Five yeah, years, watch. Yeah, so, so check this out. So I, uh, like I said, I've had a lot of big experience in this life. And so COVID happened, and uh, maybe people don't know, uh, uh, not in love with the government. I'm not in love with people telling me what to do. And so, uh, and so COVID happened, and there was a lot of telling me what to do. And I didn't want to deal with people's feelings and emotions about it. I didn't want to deal with the government. And so I just finished. I bought a, a building, a piece of crap building. And we renovated it, and, and it was like all my money. We were 100% done. Got the showroom ready to rock. COVID mm -hmm. happens. Shut the doors. I'm not dealing with anyone's crap, and we went racing. And so mm -hmm. we worked with uh, Dean Carney. Uh, he drives the Vipers FD driver, mm -hmm. and so and he, they were looking to make a change. And we'd been friends for a little bit, so we brought the the Viper in house, uh, the you know, Car One and Car Two, and we went uh, FD went drift car racing uh, for the year. And um, as you all know, racing is expensive and difficult. And uh, <laughs> yeah. and so we, we burned through some capital there, but we learned a lot of things and had a lot of great times, like with me and my friends. And, I wonder, and so Jonathan worked for me for. We've been homies for like 25 years, right? And he's worked for me for probably 10 years, right? And so between at Gas Monkey and then directly for me at, at ArcLight, mm -hmm. and so we got to go do race car stuff, like legit big dog race car stuff, and 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 with our home with our friend Dean, and like it was a big experience. And it's like, and we're all into race cars, we're all into big nasty mean stuff. And so we did that, but the money was short. So going into 22, the race car team made some changes, and then also uh, I had wrapped up a, a customer project, and I was sitting in a shop that I either had to start dealing with the public and hiring guys again and and I thought if I was if I was ever gonna do something different there was no better time than right now and it's like I had good equity in my house good equity in the shop and it's like while everything was there and I was ready to rock and roll just higher up I've been wanting to live in the mountains since I was 14 and like I said I saw an opportunity to pull the trigger so I sold everything um, and then I moved to Colorado so I live north of Colorado Springs now and uh, off the grid no, like no. Doomsday prepper no, off the grid no, no, or no? Oh, I have these kinds of thoughts, but <laughs> at the at the at the same time, though, I like riding my bicycle down to the bar and having beers. And you live out in the sticks, you got to brew your own in the bathtub, you know. And so, anyway, I. Uh, uh, I live in a, a beautiful place, and I, I can work on hot rods and race cars all day, and then I can go rock climb, you know? It's like, or I go ride my bicycle, you know, mountain bike. It's like, 
I just, it's a different lifestyle. Like I said, I had such a big life and I loved every minute of it. I thought there was no reason to not have two of them. And so I kind of clicked off one. And so I still, I don't have to give up building motorcycles, building race cars, building hot rods. I can still do all that and have an outdoor life too. And so that's exactly it. And while it may not be west, we're still east of the Rockies, I'm on front range. It's like, it puts me closer to the west. It puts me more into desert racing, more into being in the mountains and using off-road toys. Uh, and so that's, that's where I'm at. I thought it was, uh, it was an opportunity to take my life, you know, to the next level, right? It was like everything that I had known, and I still do the same work, but like put that in a box, tape it up, and then start a new one. And that's, so that's where we're at. It sounds like a home run because a lot of people try to do that and they never succeed. And that is, I'll tell you, it's do difficult. what makes you happy. Yeah figure out a way to get there yep. and do it the rest of your life. Sounds like you're there. Well, we're working on it. It's every, every day is, a, you know, is an education. You learn something new about yourself. You learn something new about the direction you're heading. And, and it's like, and people should know that it's never like check that done, right? Like it's always never, it's just always like course corrections along the way. And I'll tell you, moving, picking up an entire existence and moving to another state has been an eye opener. There have been very big challenges. And like it has really tried my patience and my belief that I did the right thing so many times. Mm -hmm. But it's like the simple things in life. It's like, well, what it was is last year after after uh, Pikes Peak Hill Climb, I uh, went back to Texas and I was like, after 40 years of living in this heat, not doing it another year. <laughs> right. And so and so like it's been I've I've enjoyed the change and I'm I'm you know I'm, I'm the new thing I'm taking on is I I've always I've bought buildings and renovated them or fixed them up, mm -hmm. but like I've never built a building from the ground up. This is a new adventure. Building hot rods, I think, is so much more linear. Build, uh, building mm -hmm. a building is, oh my <laughs> gosh, this is difficult. So well, speaking of learning a little bit about who you know yourself. Um, the guys have put together a couple of uh, quick questions that we can throw sure. at you, but Dom, what do you got for a question really quick? You going to grow that beard back out or what? Man, I'd say, oh, maybe, you know, it's like, lar <laughs> largely, it's like, it was laziness. I'll, I'll, t I'll, I'll tell you a story. So actually, I, before your story, yeah. there's a rumor going around that you actually have a massive baby face and you got carded at everywhere you went, so you had to put the beard on. Yeah, that's not, that's not, that's not it at all. No. <laughs> yeah. So, no, it's Clark Kennan, this thing. And so, uh. No, uh, so I'll tell you this. So I had a beard for 10 years and a TV show and also, and so there's this thing called continuity on TV. And like when you look a certain way, you kind of need to stay looking a certain sort of way. And so I had uh, I'd, I'd gotten tangled up in a legal program and I'd been on probation for a little bit. And so I grew my beard out. When we started filming, I had a beard and then I got off probation. I was all done with all that. And so I was like, I need, I was like, oh, I'm cutting my beard off. And they're like, oh, you can't. And so I kind of made a deal with them. You don't use apostrophe T words and I'll be cool. And so, and so the, uh, so ultimately, so I had a beard through all that and I've had beards and cut them off. But anyway, I had it for 10 years and I had this horrible piece of crap riding lawnmower because I won't spend more than like 500 bucks off marketplace to buy a lawnmower. And so I went to, so I left work because I was tired of something at work. So I went home, fixed the thing and it making noise. It didn't run great, but it ran. So I, then you have to mow and it's Texas. So it's like 4,000 degrees. And so, so I mow, open a beer, sit down. And I was like, it's just too hot. I'm hundred percent done with it so I took the clippers and like in one pass cut the whole thing off in the bathroom and this is gross but like I left it there for a week right like I couldn't bring myself to throw it away but the unique thing about that deal was is like after I cut it off and I was looking in the mirror you think like you see the videos like dad shaves his beard and the kids cries, cries yeah. or screams yeah it wasn't like that for me I don't have any children but like I looked in the mirror and the guy in the mirror was still how I saw myself in my head despite looking at myself every day with a beard for the last decade ultimately when I shaved it off that guy in the mirror was the guy that my brain recognized. Oh, it was kind of interesting for me even. A week later, I scooped the beard up and threw it away. But the... Uh, <laughs> well, actually, so let's go back to something that uh, intrigued me at the beginning of that story. And sure. that's this. I want to know what the guy in the mirror did to get on probation. Oh. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, you, know, you know, sometimes you don't feel like you've had too many and you've had too many. And uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of one of those deals and cooperated far too much instead of being more resistant. That kind of deal. I mean, it's the truth of the matter. Oh, I'm, I'm, are you going to fight with buddies or with the cops? No, 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 no. Well, no, 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 no not, not really. That, Authority figure. No, no. That there, there, there's, no there's, so, there's some no alcohol resisting, but that one was that that one was just a, oh, yeah, sure. Like, you know, I I didn't think I was there. He thought I was there. I got to spend the night in jail and so forth and so <laughs> Difference on. Difference of opinion. Yeah. You just had the badge, right? That, that, was, that was it. I, we have those from time to time. So, um, so uh, yes, Steve, quick question. Yes, this is my question. Yes. Tall socks or ankle socks? Dude, it used to be exclusively tall socks. So it was like I'd wear shorts and then tall socks. Like like, like some people in the room. And so it's like like that Steve. that was the operation. Mm -hmm. Like man, it's I, well, first of all we're in Phoenix, so you're crazy because like it's just so hot that like I just I started having to go to the short socks on it, just a little, a little ventilation, you know what I mean? But it's kind of a seasonal thing. In the winter, definitely, because also I enjoy like wild socks, weird stuff on them, that kind of thing. So I do enjoy the tall socks, but definitely a fall and winter kind of operation. Uh, I have been recently going sockless, very ankle socks, because my wife has been 
wanting me to show my legs more. Yeah. But they are wide as Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's, 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 the, that's the side effect of uh, long pants and long socks. Oh, uh, you're not kidding, Steve. Uh, definitely that's some horrible. reflection down there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got a couple of them for you. Shoot. So obviously, um, dog or cat person, we know the answer on that. Man, so, so I'll tell you. We've always, my, my grandfather would like, he would have problems killing fire ants, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's kind of like where, like, we're all, I mean, we're kind animal people. And it's like, but at the same, at the same time though, it's like, I'm very, I'm very pragmatic about how the world works and how like, you know, how violent the universe is. But that being said, like, I love dogs. They're kind of like, they're more my personality, but we've always had, we've always had cats, but we've had like cats and rabbits and birds and all, all kinds of stuff. But like, I enjoy my dogs, and as it turns out, like I love, I enjoy dogs. Period. But like, but Pibbles are, I, I really think they're the best people dogs. So. How about this, uh, beer or White Claw? Oh come on, do you need to ask? <laughs> I'm throwing it. Yeah, out. yeah. Everybody else has to. Yeah. No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. I think I, I might know the answer. No, no, to most, I'll tell you. So, so straight up, like I enjoy beer. I really, really do. However. I'm into what's cold and wet. So if it, if, it's, if we're drinking claws, I'm drinking claws. Yeah. So you, you I mean, I, I, listen. Y'all see how this car ain't robbed? I can become the claw daddy. You know, there's a price. <laughs> that means Eskimos are in. Yeah. yeah. Cold and wet. Um, uh, oh <laughs> skinny jeans or man bun? And that's a trick question. Oh my God! There's no winning that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Steve, you had a couple, I think. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what beard products do you use, if any? Um. So on TV, people mail you a lot of stuff, and mm -hmm. so it was different every month. You know what I mean? So it wasn't like, oh yes, that's the one. It was like, oh cool, look, new beard stuff, you know. But it, like, uh, ultimately, it's like I kind of variations of like wax or whatever. I use the same thing in my hair and my beard. If I can't use it in my hair and my beard, I, won't. I mean, it's wasting like, time. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. And that was the other thing, right? Like back to the beard thing. Oh my God, anyone that's got a coarse or a long beard knows this. Like. A dude traveling with a hair dryer is a screwed up situation, but it was real. Like I get out of the shower and I'd have to brush and blow dry it, and I was like, "This feels wrong." I, and not, not that it has to be. I just I didn't enjoy it, right? Like I wanted to be able to get out of the shower, rough that thing up, brush it out, hit the door, right? But you had to blow dry, it. and also because not everyone's like this. But my, have you ever seen the claymation, the Rudolph movie? Y'all remember Yukon Cornelius? And he's like, "Oh, yep, 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 you know." Uh, yep, you remember, I remember him. You remember how his beard was? Like yeah. that is how he's like. Mine just becomes like this massive bushy thing. Like I can look at it, I can see my beard down here. So that's the thing. Like I got tired of dragging a hair dryer around with me everywhere. <laughs> so that was horrible. Well, what do you got, Steve? If you could have any Harley Davidson, mm. doesn't matter what year, what model, anything, what would it be? Um. Uh, Before I'd, you say it, I'm guessing. I'm guessing probably rigid knuckle I'll or pan. I, I was gonna say a knuck of something. So, <laughs> so I've never had the opportunity to to build a knuckle. I think they've been. They've, I mean, as long as I've been building bikes, they've always been very, very pricey. Um, but it's like. Uh, I love shovels. It's like I'm good with them. I understand them well, and it's like I re and I really do, uh, really do like them. But it's like, man, for 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 me, le legit, it's a. Uh, uh, I mean, I haven't had, I haven't owned a panhead, but I'd like to build myself a panhead. It's hand shift. Uh, it's like. I'm back and forth on telescopic and springers, but it's like I like simple, light, little, old bikes. You know, and it's like yeah. Steve and I were talking about <clears throat> hand shit stuff. And it's like my last bike, mm -hmm. my daily rider was a Olin's equipped Dyna with uh, moto bars on it, all seven eights, all seven, you know, it was running, you know, rolling 1918 fat radial tires. Like it was aluminum swing arm, like built to be fast, handle well, which is in a, in a Harley, that is a. That is a silly thing to say. But anyway, it's like we tried our best, and I still, thought, I still thought when it came to fast bikes, it really quite wasn't there. But anyway, it's like that was that. But I like my old cantankerous stuff. And I'll tell you, one of the other things, as Steve and I were talking about, like the, you know, with Jesse James doing like the motorcycle manias and stuff like that, mm -hmm. when just after high school, early 2000s, like, oh, it resonated with me. Like, I was really interested in this stuff, and it really it helped accelerate me getting into this stuff. And so it was years and years and years before I could afford to buy a Harley. And I'll be straight up, like I scraped together 4,000 bucks and uh, everyone told me all you could buy was a sports center. I'll be straight up, like it wasn't my interest. I didn't want one. And so I wanted an old big bike. And so I found a bike that ran, except for all the maintenance was run out of it, for four grand, brought it back and, you know, and started building it. And, um, you know, it's been... I love, I love riding old stuff. They have a different soul. They have a different feel, and especially I like, you know, like riding hard, riding fast on old, on old stuff. Like it's a, it's a different twist. And so like getting to do the biker build off. Uh, and I'll tell you what was interesting, man. So they called, and Richard and I were like, we were gonna kill each other throwing wrenches and hammers. Like 
I'll be straight up, like we were out hard out of money, and then they and, uh, we were done. There was no, we didn't know if we were gonna get more episodes. We didn't know if there was gonna be more money. Mm -hmm. Like we we were tapped, and then they called and said, "Hey, do you want to do the biker build off?" And and I said, "Well, they have to build that garbage and that crap that I've seen in the past, or can I build whatever I want?" Mm -hmm. And they're like, "Oh, we don't care. You can build whatever you want." And the pride, the money they gave us to build the bike was enormous mm -hmm. because all the years of all the big flashy bikes had really driven the price up from a, a, a production side problem. And so the the thing that we really uh, so I got to do was I had built a bike the year before for myself that I had traded labor and it took me two years to collect all these parts. You know, it was a wishbone frame with a VL Springer and like just all this stuff I had scrapped together. I was so broke at the time, I rode it for one month and I, I had bills to pay it. So I put it on eBay, broker bought it the next day and it went to Japan or Australia or something like that. And so the pink bike that I built on the program was uh, my ability to finish it like it was like closure on that bike that i lost you know that and so really, really and then cool. and then i got to ride it to vegas and it was uh it was a wonderful ride i enjoyed every single mile well i think and i feel like you know we could probably do this for hours and hours oh sure but people get tired at some point no that's not it man i i, I think that it doesn't really matter what any of the questions that i have are you're going to have something very fulfilling to talk about <laughs> that has something to do with it no I matter hope so. what yeah and uh with that what i wanted to tell everybody is that we're going to have you back sure um actually it's going to be tomorrow but you guys won't see it for a few more days yep. but basically you're going to get a chance to drive your utv yep. back in the same section that we drove it stock and then you're going to get aaron's very in-depth and mechanical descriptive but, opinion and so, as to what you've gotten out of this thing yep. that is coming very very soon and, and, emotion, and, and emotional to to have you know to invest x amount of money mm -hmm. in something to be unsatisfied with it and mm -hmm. to finally find the satisfaction with it. and it's not like i mean it's like i know where we're headed i know what to expect and i think mm -hmm. we're going to get there i think we're i mean it's like get, getting out of the car i expect it to be a radically different car uh, because i know i know how much room there was to grow yeah so yeah well we're looking forward to supplying that but yep. i think that everybody's gonna want to hear your exact oh, opinion yeah, on it sure. and uh, straightforward and honest, and we know we're gonna get that from you on it. Sure, uh, we're gonna put that together with all the YouTube uh, edit together of this live uh, with it, so you're gonna get a before and an after on that. Uh, so you guys tune into that in the next few days. Uh, but for now, I think we're probably gonna send it out of here. And you know who sends it the best? It's actually yeah, Steve. I was say, I was saying, I've heard, I've heard the tales. Yeah, right now, but. Um, I, do, I do okay. I get you by. Do, you yeah. do, let, me, let me hang on to this by. so you can actually do your job, sir. Well, guys, if you want to see what Aaron is up to, follow him on Instagram at the ArcLight on Instagram, I believe, right? The ArcLight? Yes, sir. Okay. Or ArcLightFab.com. But if you want to buy anything from us, visit www.shocktherapyusa.com or call us at the shop, 623-217-4959. Mm -hmm.